about a year and a half ago, maybe closer to two years, uh, the Clapbrook Forest Communities Program started thinking about uh, climate change and what it might mean out here in, in this region. Um, and because there was a lot of work going on through the province and has been for a while about specific impacts to, to forests and forest ecosystems. But um, we very quickly came to the realization that although forests and, uh, and impacts to those ecosystems was important, what was really, what was really uh, more important out here was uh, were the communities and, and uh, vulnerability of communities to impacts from climate change. And so, uh, uh, as part of, I say, as part of the Clackwood Forest Communities Program, with the the Heshkwit and uh, Hauset and uh, Tulukwit First Nations, we uh, embarked on a community-based project to understand uh, some of the potential impacts of climate change out here, and then to look at vulnerabilities within those communities and what type of uh, adaptation um, steps might be taken. My name is Melinda Swan. I'm from the Housing First Nation. I work for the Housing Council and I met one on one with the elders. And um, there was this was this kind of stuff wasn't something new to a lot of them there because they've lived through a lot of changes and just adapted to what's happened. And that they feel like it's um, some of the responses I got is it's just the way things are supposed to happen and. Um, I believe, I mean, it's easy to believe that and then it's the other side of the coin is that it's happening because of what we do on every, on every day. The, the climate change awareness has, has changed the sort of thinking about the infrastructure and what type of things that they want to have in terms of sewage and making sure that those pumping stations are a little higher above the sea mm -hmm. level. Yeah, I think so and, and with the addition of the outcome of this project is bringing more awareness of what's to come yet in the future and um, there was discussions about how we never used to have this type of stuff too so it's even adapting just to um, what the Europeans is what was used to word what Europeans brought to us so the final outcome of the project is to better what we have and to plan for what's possibilities. Uh, my name is Sam Mickey. Um, I'm from uh, Heshkwit, First Nation. Uh, I was born in Tofino and I grew up in and around this area of Tofino here. And over your lifetime, have you noticed that um, with climate changing, I know most people uh, that I've spoken with have said that, um, for example, the summers are a lot hotter and drier. Have you noticed that there's been any change in resources? There's, yeah, yeah, well, there's, there's, there's like the sea otter, you know, that was, that was kind of disappearing for, for, for quite a number of years and uh, they've been reintroduced, you know, and, and it, it took about eight, nine years to come down the Hitchcock Peninsula, you know, to, to, to ravage our, our, our shellfish resources there. And in the harbor also, you know, it's not just our people over digging or over harvesting, you know, it's, it's them. Them pretty little creatures that people like to see, so sea otter, and they're they're constantly eating, you know, because they don't really have any fat on them, you know. So that's that's a big challenge for us, mm -hmm. and, and and our our forefathers had some way of of controlling them, so we got to find some, you know, that that same way too. So. My name is 
Sayo Masu from the Tlaok First Nation. I work in our natural resource department now and uh, have to interact with uh, a lot of our fishermen and harvesters of our, of our territory. And on this climate change project, it's brought a lot of information to our community. And then getting it to a stable point of resilience and then you can handle climate change. You can handle what's coming at you, you can overcome it, you can just deal with it. Like you like you're describing our elders did. You just went we went through phases, but you're going through phases on a on a, a healthy and resilient homeland. Uh, going through phases while you're destroying mountainsides in the sixties and going through phases while you're overfishing everywhere, that's hard. I, I think we're at a point now where we're, we're trying to manage everything for sustainability and fisheries, uh, kelp forests, and, uh, forests and clean water. It's, uh, I think it's got to a level of discussion now where we, we might get a model that is sustainable. But common sense would dictate that we're building houses more suited to the west coast now uh, than, uh, than cookie cutter housing built for Ontario, uh, built for our climate, so uh, it's hard to say that we're managing more for climate change. It's, it's tough because we're people of the ocean and, and, our, and our first aspirations of building our new community at Long Beach was to just keep building our community along the waterfront as, as our people would have historically, yet, well, I mean, there's competing interest to not have us on the front of the beach, but uh, with Parks Canada. But then also the rationale to locate our community safer up the hill. Uh, so you get that conflict between our culture and our traditions to being ocean-going people and to live facing the ocean and, uh, and trying to have a sustainable community that will be, be long-lived with quality housing. Uh, we need to distinguish the natural ebb and flow between this is a, a system of, of habitat that's recovering from deforestation, or over-harvesting, overfishing, uh, the disappearance of the kelp forest because of, uh, of uh, the hunting of the otter in the 1900s. Um, so as all each one of those recover, our our species will be uh, will be full and intact. Our homelands will be more resilient, capable of handling climate change. Um, but if we're in a weakened state of, of resilience in our, in our homelands, climate change will be much more difficult to, to handle. I think there is a, there's an absolutely good news story in the sense that you have intact forest largely. You have some of the best condition um, forest like this left anywhere. And I would much prefer to be sitting in a community at the bottom of one of those mountainsides then somewhere further south or further north that doesn't have that sitting behind them because those forests create, they give you resilience in the system. So they take in those, they, you know, they dampen the effects of the storm, they dampen the effects for a long time potentially into the future of, of increasing temperatures. You know, the forests still are cool when you walk into them on a hot day. They moderate all of those effects and they moderate sediment. We know all of that stuff. So you should be extremely grateful that you're right here. Some of the